Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, seminar. Uh, today, we are very happy to have Yu Kenny from Yale, and he will uh, tell us about diamonds and free labs. Thanks, Yu. Thanks, Yu. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, happy to be here. Um, this is a uh, joint work with uh, my grad student, Alan Chi, and it's based on some previous work we did with Dan Douglas, who's a postdoc at Yale. Um, and feel free to ask questions wrapped with anything. I think we're a somewhat diverse audience and we have some experts, experts on various parts. <laughs> but uh, I've, there's kind of a lot to say to even to get to the statement of the theorem. So I thought I would start by, oops, uh, just sort of giving you a little, little preview <laughs> of sort of a, What's going on here? You know, here's a here's a graph, just a square grid, n by n square grid, <laughs> and I took a three different uh, perfect matching dimer covers of the square grid. There's a blue one, a green one, and a red one. It's kind of hard to see uh, at this, uh, and I just super, just <laughs> them up, just took, chose them independently and and drew them on top of each other, and then I chose the boundary condition slightly different for the red one, uh, but you know it's not so important. But for these boundary conditions, you, you know, you see sort of just a very complicated mess of stuff. Uh, but it turns out that there are sort of three different types of configurations that can happen, which I, you know, just sort of using some random entomological uh, terminology, I call it slugworm or beetle. And the question is, you know, how do you detect uh, from a configuration like this which one happens? And what does that mean? All right. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so the main object is a web. So let me start by telling you what a web is. It's a very simple, with some, right, so a, a web uh, is, and in, in my case, uh, web, well, okay, a web is just a trivalent bipartite graph. So bipartite means the, the vertices are black and white and edges only go from black to white or, or white to black. Uh, trivalent means a degree three, except it's going to have some boundary vertices, and it's going to be a planar graph. So I'm going to put the boundary vertices on the on the outer boundary and on the boundary of the disk here. So it's a graph in a disk uh, like that. Here's some examples. Okay, and it doesn't have to be connected. Uh, it doesn't even have to be really planar. I, I, you know, you can you can draw it if you want so the edges can cross. Uh, that's no big deal. You'll see in a, later on how to convert your non-planar web to a planar web. Okay, any questions? Um, what, what are webs for? Well, webs uh, come from uh, representation theory. Uh, uh, and web here, <clears throat> every time you have a web, it gives you a certain function called the trace, we call the trace, the trace of the web, which uh, is a multilinear function, which takes a bunch of vectors and co-vectors and gives you a number, right? So, uh, and I have to, I'm going to explain what this function is, but the at least the domain of the function, uh, it's going to take m vectors. So all these vectors are vectors in R3. So everything in this in this talk is about R3. Um, it's about SL3 or R3, and V is just a copy of R3. This or if you like the standard representation of SL3. So I've got m vectors, one for each white boundary vertex, and n uh, co-vectors, uh, one for each black boundary vertex. And, and I plug those into my trace and that spits out a number. And uh, that number is supposed to be somehow in SL3 invariant. And so here's a couple of examples. Before I give you the definition, let me just give you some examples. Uh, if I, if you, if you uh, this, this particular web takes as input three vectors. So see, you see the, the boundary vertices are white. So it takes the vectors, three vectors, one for each boundary vertex. And it's, the web spits out the determinant of those three vectors. That is the determinant of the matrix whose columns are those three vectors in order. That is a function, uh, right, which is multilinear, uh, right, a multilinear function of the three uh, entries. And it has this invariance property. If you, if you take the three vectors and you multiply them uh, on the left, but uh, if you act by the same matrix in SL3, the determinant doesn't change. Okay, 
that's that's the kind of object that a web will give us uh, something which you know is invariant under SL3 and uh, you know multilinear. And here's another example where this is also a very simple web which just have a single edge and it, it's got one white and one black boundary vertex. So it takes a vector and a covector. And how do you get a number? Well, you just apply the covector to the vector and it, it spits out a number. Uh, and the how is that SL3 invariant? Well, uh, you have to think about how SL3 acts on the dual R3, but it acts in precisely the way so that this pairing is invariant. It's almost kind of the definition of, of how, how, how should you make SL3 act on the dual? You should make it in such a way that this, this pairing is invariant. You mean as a to the minus one then? Yeah, mean? that's right. Uh, v, if you think of V as like a, a row vector, then it acts on the right by the transpose inverse. Well, I mean, the X on the right, yeah, okay, <laughs> in the correct way. Okay, so how do you define the trace in, for a general web? Any questions so far? How do you find a trace for a general web? Well, it's a, here's, here's kind of, there's sort of a net, tensor network definition, but here's sort of an interpret, combinatorial interpretation of the definition, which uh, is, you know, I don't know if we should really deserve credit for this one, but it's just sort of an interpretation of the usual definition. Uh, this is in our previous paper. Uh, so if I wanted to find the trace by multi multilinearity, it suffices to give the trace on a set of basis vectors. And there are three basis vectors on R3. I'm going to call them, instead of E1, E2, E3, I'm going to call them ER, EG, and EB, where RG and B are the colors, red, green, and blue. So. Once I know the trace on the basis vectors, of course, I know the trace on any, any set of vectors. And how is the trace on a set of basis vectors uh, determined? Well, suppose I have this web here, and I'm going to plug in some basis vectors to the boundary. And, and let's choose the, the, the R one, the red one, uh, at all four boundary vertices. And then what the trace does is it counts the number of colorings of the web. Uh, colorings which have the property that at each vertex, so, so what you do is you color the edges of the web with, with three colors, red, green, and blue. And at each vertex, all each in interior vertex, all three colors have to appear. And so, and then the, there's a sign uh, which is listed over here. Uh, and so uh, if, I want, if I want to compute the trace, when I plug in the uh, all four vectors, all four red, the red basis vectors, then there's two, then the, I get, the answer is two because there's two colorings. Well, up to sign, and the sign is just given by, uh, uh, at, each, at each vertex, there's a local sign, and you just take the product of the, all the local vertex signs to get the sign of the, the whole thing. And the sign is just given by, uh, the determined by the cyclic order of the colors at that vertex. If it's you know red, green, blue, at a white vertex, you get plus. And if it's a red, blue, green, going counterclockwise, you get a minus. And those conventions are reversed at the black vertex. The, the web is always planar. Yeah, it's always planar. Yeah, we're always doing planar graphs here. Um, OK, so uh, yeah, so in this case, if, if all the vertices are red, then there's two ways to complete it. You can do green, blue, green, blue, or blue, green, blue, green. And you know, if you check the signs, you see that they're both plus. So they add up in the trace assigned to the to the to these basis vectors is two. If I put the if I if I do some other set of basis vectors like these ones, there's only one way to complete the coloring and, and the, again, but again the signs are plus, so you know it comes out the trace is one there. Can right? you say a little bit about what is happening algebraically? Like is there a Jung diagram somewhere? <laughs> uh, not yet. Uh, algebraically what's going on? <laughs> yeah. There's a sort of a tensor network definition where you Assign to each interior vertex a certain tensor, a certain element of a tensor product of three copies of the vector space there, and then you have to do the contraction along every edge. It's a little bit more complicated, but the, this is what sort of boils down. Uh, but when I when I state it like this, is the SL three invariance is not at all clear. And in fact, it's, it's not not even clear what that means. But uh, but from the tensor network definition. You know, it's sort of built, built, built up, so you see immediately that's the SL three invariance. 
Is that is that satisfactory? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and did did you say these are all of the SL three invariant functions? Like like all the yeah. I'll, I'm going to, to discuss that right now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about reduced webs now. This is a special class of webs. A web is reduced if it is planar. So so I'm here. I'm only talking about webs in the disk here. If it's planar and it has no faces of degree zero, two, or four, uh, like this example is a reduced web. All the faces are six. Here, this is non-reduced. It's got a face of degree four. Uh, if you, it's kind of easy to, for a fixed set of boundary vertices and colors, black and white colorings, there's always a, just a finite number of reduced planar webs. These are also called non-elliptic webs. Uh, in, for example, if there's six boundary vertices and they go white, black, white, black, white, black, then there's only six uh, reduced webs, which you can see here. And I called these, you know, these guys are slugs, these guys are worms, and those guys, that's a beetle. Right, so this is just some little little Euler characteristic argument you can you can count, uh, but but asking how many reduced webs there are, this is indeed a uh, young diagram, uh, I mean a young tableau calculation. What are reduced webs for? What's the point of the reduced webs? So, so, do you mean each reduced web corresponds to a young tableau? Young, young tableau, yeah. Okay. But I'm not going to talk about that part here. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> why do we care about reduced webs? Well, Cooperberg, uh, who I think was the first guy to even talk about webs, showed that reduced webs actually form a basis for the invariant uh, multilinear functions. So, you know, you can write on any sort of complicated web, it will give you some function, some invariant function, but uh, you, you only need to think about reduced webs because every other web is sort of some sort of a linear combination of these basic, basic webs. Uh, and and here's, a, here's a very simple example. If I have uh, six boundary vertices that are all white, so this is a function of six vectors. I want an SL3 invariant function of six vectors in R3. This is a, a, a five-dimensional space, the multilinear. If it's a multilinear function, which is invariant, th there's only sort of a five-dimensional space of those things. And, and the, a basis for that five-dimensional space is given by these six webs. Uh, and right, so for each of these webs, there's some function which uh, you can, in principle, write down from the from the coloring definition from before. But I could just tell you that in this case, you know, you recognize uh, the, the function for this particular web is just the determinant product of two determinants. You take the first three vectors and you take their determinant, and the second three vectors and you take their determinant and you just multiply the two. That's that's sort of obviously an invariant function. And, and maybe you can see that it, it's like two copies of the determinant one, which from this couple of slides ago. And of course, these are also products of determinants, uh, but these are not. These are some more complicated kind of functions. Um, yeah. Uh, if I take some, some other, I, I can, of course, if you hand me six vectors, I can take the determinant of the first, the second, and the fifth, and at times the second determinant of the third, the fourth, and the sixth, or something. That's also an invariant function, but that function will also will uh, doesn't appear in this list, but it is a linear combination of the things in this list. That's the content of this statement here. Is that okay? So, being the basis is just with respect to linear. Yeah, just a linear basis, linear basis of the linear vector, linear basis, yeah. Vector space of uh, invariant functions, invariant multilinear functions. Okay, um, how is that result proved? Well, Cooperberg essentially showed, gave all possible relations between webs and they're all consequences of these skein relations, skein operations here. Uh, if, if, if in a web I see a, a loop which is not connected to anything else. Well, let's see. First of all, let's think about since since each web gives you a function, I can think about a formal linear combination of webs as a as a as also as a function. And uh, I want to 
I could consider formal linear combinations of web subject to these operations, which is, uh, you know, you can replace a loop in a web, by, throw the loop away and multiply the coefficient of the remaining web by three. Uh, that, that leads to the same function, uh, basically because a loop has three colors, red, green, or blue. And if you have C, uh, if you see a bygone uh, a, a, a base of degree two, you can just remove it from the graph like this and, and replace the coefficient. By, by twice the coefficient, then you know, you'll get the same function. And likewise, if we see a square face, th this web can be replaced by two webs where you connect this way or that way, and uh, the trace of this web will be the sum of the traces of, the, of those two webs. So these are ways to take your essentially complicated web and reduce it to simpler webs, to reduce webs. Uh, and, and in this way, you can take any planar web and write it as a linear combination of, of reduced webs by removing faces of degree zero, two, or four. And the, the uh, even if your web is not planar, there's a, there's a more general, there's a maybe a more fundamental skein relation, which is this one, which, which you can think of this as replacing a crossing. So if I, if I wrote this guy as the difference of those two guys, then each crossing can be replaced by two locally planar, a linear combination of two locally planar webs. So this allows you to sort of remove the crossings one at a time from your web and eventually take any potentially non-planar web and write it as a linear combination of planar, planar things. And then once they're planar, you can use these relations to make them reduced planar. Right, so, and, right, so then uh, Cooperberg showed that, well, of course, uh, these skein relations are made to, to so, so that they respect the trace. The trace of a web is the sum of the traces of the, you know, the trace of the web on the left-hand side is, when you apply the skein relation, it's the same as the sum of the traces on the right-hand side. Uh, I didn't state that very well, but the, the point is that any, uh, Cooperberg showed that any planar web is equivalent via the skein relations to a linear, unique linear combination of reduced webs. Essentially saying that those gain relations give you all possible relations between the invariant functions. But in practice, you know, it's a nice sort of diagrammatic way to take a web and do some, you know, topological moves to reduce it to a linear combination of reduced webs, rewrite it as a linear combination of reduced webs. So in this case, I took that square face and I replaced it with the two verticals or the two horizontals. And then this guy has a bygone, which I just removed and replaced it with a factor of two. Good. Um, so now let's sort of segue over to the probability model, which is this uh, dimer, dimer model or perfect matching model, right? Maybe everybody knows what a dimer cover is, but is it take a, a graph my graphs are all going to be planar and bipartite graphs like the square grid. And uh, we want to understand the space of dimer covers of a graph. Uh, well, you know, the first, the first thing to do about understanding is to count the number of dimer covers. And for a for this kind of an amazing formula due to Castellin and Temporally and Fisher sort of simultaneously in the 60s, they showed how to count the number of dimer covers of a of a square grid and, and shortly thereafter, any planar graph. And the, the kind of amazing formula for the number of dimer covers uh, of the square grid, n by n square grid is here. It's kind of a, I don't feel like it's always worth showing this formula because you really feel like there's something mysterious going on uh, in this dimer model. And so you, you want a bipartite graph, right? So you put, I mean, you, before you had a black Bi and black bipartite. And white. Yeah. Yes. So here you would put uh, black, white, black, white, and yeah, then that's right. you, yeah, put opposite of one layer. Yeah. Yeah. The square grid is a bipartite graph. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did it for, for arbitrary planar graphs, not necessarily bipartite, yeah. but here we only need a bipartite case. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to be thinking about sort of triple dimer covers, but let me just explain about the double dimer cover, which was work 
we did uh, you know 10 years ago or so with David Wilson. If I take if I take two dimer covers of the square grid, like here I took a red and a blue one with slightly different boundary conditions, the red one has these uh, dimers sticking out in the corners. Then when I uh, draw them on top of each other, I get these uh, these this interesting structure, this this paths which start at, at the corners at one corner and end at another corner. And there's sort of two two things that can happen. The path from the lower right corner here can either end up over there or end up over there. And if 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 the original graph was square, it's sort of fifty percent chance of going one way or the other. But if the graph is rectangular, uh, it's a non-trivial question: what's the probability of connecting sort of vertically or connecting horizontally? Right. And if I have more complicated boundary conditions. There, there are many sort of possible topologies of how th this double dimer model can connect, the, the points can connect on the boundary can connect up. And so you, you know, it becomes an, you know, sort of kind of a non-trivial combinatorial question, what's the probability of connecting up in a certain way? And this we, we solved with David Wilson in, in 2011 here. Uh, for the, for, this is for the double dimer model, which is two webs. Uh, for any sort of topological connection, the probability that that happens when you take two, you know, uniform random dimer covers of your graph can be computed. Uh, and it's computed in terms of this certain certain matrix entries of a certain matrix called XX, which is called the boundary measurement matrix or reduced Gastelum matrix. And the answer is kind of simple in terms of this. I'll, I'll have to explain where this matrix comes from. It's related to the Castellini matrix, but I'll explain on the next slide. Once you have this matrix, which it, in this case, if you have only sort of four boundary points, like in the previous slide here, well, not that one, but uh, here, there's only four sort of boundary, re relevant boundary points here, the four corners. Once you have those four corners, the matrix here is just gonna be a two by two matrix and the, the, the uh, unnormalized probability is the probability that you connect from one to one and two to two, or one to two and two to one, those are just products of entries in that in that in that X matrix, uh, right? And of course, if you want the actual probability, you have to you have to normalize by dividing by the sum of the two probabilities. So these this these polynomials are these sort of unnormalized probabilities uh, of this, of those events. Uh, and if you have a more complicated boundary conditions like this, six boundary conditions, then they're not just as monomials, they can be some polynomials in the matrix entries, like this one. So, you know, there's, there's kind of a, a lot, a lot. I, I could spend some time discussing this, but I really want to get to the, to the three triple dimer case, which has a similar statement. But before I do that, I, I do have to tell you what this, this X matrix is here, uh, because that's this, the same matrix, the X matrix will appear in the triple dimer configuration in the three web case. Okay, so to explain the X matrix, let me first remind you what the Castellane matrix is for a planar graph. Uh, I've got a planar bipartite graph, finite planar bipartite graph, which has you know the same number of white vertices and black vertices. So it has, and, and uh, potentially has dimer covers. And so we make this matrix K, which is just a signed uh, bipartite adjacency matrix. So the rows are indexed by the white vertices and the columns indexed by the black vertices. Uh, and the entries are plus or minus one or zero, depending on whether the vertices are adjacent or not. And if, well, zero if they're not adjacent. And if they are adjacent, you're gonna get a plus or minus one where the signs <coughs> are, are put in, uh, so where the signs have to satisfy the following rule that uh, uh, around each face, the number of minus signs depends on the length of the face. If the, if the face has length L, where L is even, then uh, this, a face, that face has to have L over two plus one modulo two minus signs. It's a little bit, a little bit you know, mysterious at the moment uh, condition, but that's called the Castellane sign condition. Once you find a matrix with that, with that, which satisfies that condition, then the determinant of the matrix, the absolute value of the determinant, is the number of dimer covers of the graph. That's essentially the restatement of the Castellane theorem. 
And uh, yeah, so for example, for the square grid, uh, every face of degree four has to have an odd number of minus signs. So you could, for example, put the signs like this on every, every other vertical edge. That's a Castellane sign signing of that matrix and its determinant will be the number of time recoveries of that graph. Okay, so any questions about the, is that new for anybody here? Okay. Well, oh, okay, so don't, don't be shy about asking questions. Uh, where, what about the X matrix? The X matrix is the, the so-called so boundary measurement matrix. So now you have a, a, your planar graph has some specified vertices on the boundary. Uh, and you, I'm gonna rewrite, I'm gonna rewrite my Castellane matrix from the previous page as this sort of, in this sort of block form, A, B, C, D, where A is indexing the boundary vertices and D is indexing the, the interior vertices, the internal vertices. Then you can make this uh, sure, sure complement or sure reduction. Uh, the X matrix is just A minus B, D inverse C. This is sort of a kind of a standard linear algebraic uh, construction of a new matrix, which uh, only sort of, which only sort of feels the boundary. I mean, it's indexed by the boundary vertices, but uh, it, it's uh, in some sense integrating over the, the interior structure. This is, you know, well, it's a linear algebraic construction. From a combinatorial point of view, there's a there's an easy, well, uh, there's an interpretation of the entries in the X matrix. And the, the, the WB entry in that X matrix, where here now WB are boundary vertices, uh, it's the number of dimer covers of the graph where you you take all the interior vertices and you include those two boundary vertices, the W and the B, take the number of dimer covers of that graph, you divide by the number of dimer covers just of the interior part, and then there's a sign, which I'm not going to talk about, but you know, just falls from the linear from the linear algebra, there's some sign that happens. So for example, in, uh, well, I don't know if we need to see the explicit example, but uh, right when you when your graph has just you know four boundary vertices, then it's just a two by two matrix. And for example, in this case, the one one entry uh, is just the number of dimer covers of the graph where you include these two but not those two. So it's A B H as the numerator, and the denominator is the number of dimer covers of just the interior stuff, which is E G plus F H. Okay, so that's the X matrix, the boundary measurement matrix. Uh, it's something that Osnikov used in the, his study of the Grassmannian, but uh, you know, in terms of the Castellan matrix, it's just a sure reduction of the Castellan matrix. There's always the same number of white and black vertices on the boundary? Not necessarily. So then would you have two X matrices depending on whether you take the white or is XWB that you wrote? Would be many zero. Yeah, X just won't be won't be a square matrix necessarily. If you have more whites than blacks, then there'll be more rows than columns. But the internal okay. uh, register, the the right. I have to explain. Well, okay, so <laughs> ask me later. <laughs> but you're right. There's a there's a way to define this when the number of whites and blacks on the boundary are different. Uh, you just have to make sure that the. I have to explain a little bit more, which I didn't. Didn't, don't have time. All right. Uh, okay, so now let's go to the triple dimer model. Here, here I'm going to do sort of the same thing. I'm just going to take three independent samples of a dimer model on a graph with slightly different boundary conditions, like, like this. In this example, I took the red, the red one had uh, you know the extra corners, and the green and blue didn't. And I guess you see some, you know. I drew them on top of each other. So this uh, this purple means there's a red and a blue, and the, the I don't know what color that is. Dark green means <laughs> what's dark green mean? It means <laughs> blue and green together, and so on. And this sort of that's supposed to be gray. It's red, green, and blue on top of each other. Okay, so it it kind of it's kind of like a web. It it is a web in the sense that. You know, every vertex has degree three, but it's only degree three if you take into account the multiplicity. The fact that fact is that this 
this edge has two, two dimers covering it, the, the green and the blue, the green and the red one. And so at this vertex, there are really three, it, it has degree three, just like the definition of a web, except only degree three with multiplicity. So, so we call that, we wanted to distinguish that from an actual three web, which in which every vertex has to actually degree three. So we called it a multi-web or a graphical web. Uh, right, so here, yeah, in fact, here's the definition of what's a multi-web, also known as a graphical web or a triple dimer cover, is just a, 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 a map from a, a choice of multiplicity for each edge. So the multiplicities can be zero, one, two, or three. And, and at each internal vertex, the sum of the multiplicities has to add up to three. That's what I'm saying here. Degree three at all internal vertices. So here's kind of a picture of a multi-web once you, once you erase the colors. So a multi-web doesn't have the red, green, and blue coloring. It's just a, a multi-graph, uh, multi-subgraph of G with, the, with this property. So, and I try to, try to illustrate it here with the thick, where the thickness is the multiplicity. So this is an edge of multiplicity three. The black ones have multiplicity zero and so on. Multiplicity one, multiplicity two. That's a multi-web. And just like webs, uh, multi -web, web labels are just like a, some small tweak of the definition of a web. They still have traces defined in the same way. Uh, it's the trace of its underlying abstract web. Uh, well, okay. The trace of a web is uh, counts the number of ways to color the edges, red, green, and blue, where a multi edge of Multiplicity k gets k colors, and 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 but again at each internal vertex all three colors appear, uh, and then there's some signs involved which I'm sort of not telling you about. Right, it's this this the trace of a multi-web is a sign number of triples of dimer covers with the correct boundary colors which which uh, which which give rise to that web. Does that make sense? Uh, <clears throat> okay, and, and so so now uh, we're trying to get closer to the main result, which is that when you take this random yeah, triple of times in the trace, you had signs minus one and one. Yeah. So now you didn't have signs. That's correctly. right. That's right. There, there's a little lemma that says that for a planar graph, all configurations have the same sign. And maybe all minus or all plus. So in some sense, the you don't have to worry about the sign for planar objects. If you're if you're on a more webs on a more on a higher genus surface or a topologically non-trivial surface, then you have to worry about the signs. But for the planar case, we don't have to worry about the signs. Okay. Inside this uh, three multi-web is a slightly mysterious substructure. Uh, which I call a spine, maybe spine is uh, just, spine is the wrong word, but there's some, in, inside there, there's a certain reduced web, which you can kind of see in blue here. And I want to explain how to compute the probability of, of a particular reduced web type in there, right? I want to know whether this is a, that is a slug or a worm or a beetle. And here's the, uh, here's the, uh, main sort of observation. If I start with a random, uh, so what I, what I can do is just take three dimer covers and the red one, the green one, and the blue one, just draw them on top of each other. And then if I forget the colors, I, I lose information, but I, 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 I forget the colors and I get a random triple dimer cover. That's called a random triple dimer cover, which is the same as a random web, multi-web. So, uh, and then, I take my random web and I and I reduce it. I can uh, take write it as a linear combination of reduced webs and pick one of the reduced webs, sort of arbitrarily according to the, co the its coefficient. Right? And so I get a random reduced web when I do that. And so what happens is that starting from this random triple of dimer covers, I forget some information. This is like a many-to-one mapping, and this is and from here. I have to sort of add in some information because I have to, to pick a random subweb. I have to sort of do some sort of coin flips, add some coin flips. 
and the but uh, the the amount of information you lose here is the amount of information you have to put in there and and uh, somewhat amazingly, it turns out to be a bijection between random triples of dimer covers and random reduced webs. At which stage did you add information? Well, when, if I take a random web, every time I do a, a skein relation, I, I you have to pick which one I have to pick which one I, 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 I go down. So do a coin flip to pick which, which one you go, you go down. Or sometimes the, you know, you multiply a coefficient by three or two, and that involves uh, some extra, yeah. Unfortunately, the, the, even though there's a bijection here, I mean, they, they, there's some sort of measure preserving mapping between the two. Uh, it's not sort of canonical, at least as far as we understand. We, we don't know how to give a canonical bijection from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. That is, they have the same, they have the same size, but uh, uh, there doesn't, you know, the, whenever you do a, the sequence of skein relations, the, the, the result depends on the order in which you do those skein relations. If you do them in a different order, you get slightly different uh, reduced webs. But how did you get the spine of the famous slide? Yeah, so I, I cheated <laughs> because I used a non-canonical uh, I used a ejection, but I sort of chose that somewhat uh, arbitrarily. Basically, the the, the to get the to get the skein, you know, to get the, to, to do this to do the skein reduction reduction, you have to choose a face, and then if it if it's a zero, two, or four face, you do the reduction there and flip a coin. And but the so if you choose some, if there's some order up ordering. A priori ordering of the faces, then you get sort of a an algorithm, but it, it depends on the ordering, and there doesn't seem to be there's no natural ordering of the faces. Oops. Okay, so now I can. How are we doing on time? Oh, yeah. Here's the main theorem. Just to be clear, bijection doesn't mean. Discussing it, but bijection doesn't mean one to one correspondence, right? It means measure preserving. They're, they're of the same, they're really a one to one correspondence. They really have the same size. Right? There's a, there's a finite number of, uh, sorry, there's a finite number of triple diamond covers, and there's a, well, <laughs> The set of objects which appear over here also has a certain enumeration, and they're they're the same enumeration. I mean, they're the same size. And so, like, if you fix the randomness of the coin flips, then you would get an explicit bijection, but it wouldn't be canonical because that's right. You have to fix that's right. That's right. I used an explicit bijection to get to get the on, on the previous slide. Um, but maybe in some sense you're right. Each Let's talk about it. <laughs> I'm feeling I'm feeling a time pressure right now, so I want to. Uh, uh, Looks like there's a question. There's a question from Zoom. So Dima, Dima raised the hand. Yeah, go ahead, Dima. I don't know if we can hear you. Uh, Rick, I'm really sorry that you're under pressure, but uh, I don't quite understand. In the right column, you have a measure on reduced webs, right? So if you start with this, that, that's right. I mean, below, then the coefficients are not necessarily all equal in in, that's in, correct. in what you get. But when you get then, to experience, and yeah. on the left, there, there is only a uniform measure. Yes, here there's uniform measure. Here the measure is not uniform because each each guy has a certain number of pre images. Here these these two things are the same. I mean, top left. Top left, it's uniform, right? Yes, that's correct. And, and top right, it's not. Or is it? That's correct. It's not uniform. Each, I see. Each web has some pre-image, which is it's hard to hard to define. That's correct. Okay. That, okay. That's the sense which Scott was also asking in the question. I think I understood that. 
but they're like integer weights. On the, integer right? weights, yeah, positive, okay. non-negative integer weights. Yeah. So here, but but okay. So the main the main result is we can compute the various probabilities, right? For any reduced web, like uh, we can compute the probability that that reduced web happens when you take a uniform triple of dimer covers. And there's some expression here. You can see in that expression the trace. You can see that in the expression some something called x sub tau, which is a uh, well you know product of matrix entries, or maybe more generally a polynomial in the matrix entries. And then there's this matrix. Uh, this is just an integer matrix, which I call the skein reduction matrix. It's the matrix which tells you how to reduce a. Okay, I have to explain what that matrix is. Um, and then I'll be out of time. But uh, I think that you still have about the 20 minutes due to the so many. Oh, I forgot. We didn't start at 11. Okay, so I still have some time. Okay, great. <laughs> I thought it had gone kind of yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, So let me let me explain this uh, this expression. So you know, uh, first of all, what's the sum over? Um, and it, it's the easiest case is when you have the same number of black and white boundary vertices. Then the uh, This the sum here, the set of three partitions, just means pairings of the black and black and white no black and white boundary vertices. You look at all possible, you know, if there's n black boundary vertices and n white boundary vertices, then there's sort of n factorial possible pairs, ways to pair them up. If if there's more whites than blacks, then you have to also you have to include the pairs and some all white triples. Uh, you have to partition the the boundary vertices into triples. Just like we did in the in the very first slide, where we had this determinant, right? The determinant was this kind of a special web which had a single three white vertices and one single guy, and then we had the the, the pairs which consist of one white and one black. Those are sort of the fundamental building blocks, uh, and you want to you want to partition the nodes into white triples and black white pairs. And then there's this matrix. Let me just give give you the example on the next slide. Here's the matrix for Right, so so when I have four white boundary vertices and one black boundary vertices, there are four possible ways to partition them into pairs and triples. I have to have one white triple and one pair, and black guy can either go to one, two, three, or four, and then the remaining three white boundary vertices have to make a triple. And there's sort of four ways to do that, and there are three uh, reduced webs in this case, which are listed here, and then there's this matrix which. Are, which is the relevant matrix in that, in that theorem. And once you know the matrix, then you can just sort of write down the probabilities uh, where the, in terms of these uh, monomials in the X matrix, which come from the, which correspond to the different columns here. So let, let me uh, explain how you get the matrix, because that's kind of the interesting part. And, then time permitting, I'll tell you where the monomials come from, although it's maybe less, less important. So uh, these, these are webs up here, right? Each of these is a web. It's just a not, maybe not a planar web. Some of them are already planar, some of them are not. But that this, this non-planar web, right? You see that crossing there? I can resolve that crossing using my skein relation. And when I resolve it, you know, I either resolve it into this guy or the double Y, and it resolves into this linear combination of the reduced webs. So that non-planar web is this particular, is one times this web minus one times that web. Uh, but when you write it in the basis, this is, remember the reduced webs form a basis for the, for the web, for the invariant functions. Okay, so you write each of these, and each of these things is uh, is kind of a simple function because it's a product of determinants and pairings of vectors and covectors, right? So all those are very simple functions, which in principle you can you know write down their trace very easily. And then each of, each of these webs, if you want to know the trace of this web, it's just a the corresponding. You just look at the corresponding row of the matrix, and you just take the sum of those two invariant functions. I mean, 
that, that, that's, that's essentially what's going on. Uh, and so let me go back to this. So now, now you, you kind of understand what this matrix is. It's the matrix which on the previous slide, and then uh, you know you sum up these these entries with their traces, and you get the probabilities. There's some complicated complication involving the signs. Uh, it's not so important. I think the, the the takeaway from this slide is that there is some formula for the probabilities. Which and this reduced web is according to the non-canonical algorithm mentioned. No, no, no. The the algorithm. That, that's playing no role, no role in this on this slide. The reduced web is just a coming from the planar uh, graphs with the correct boundary with with uh, no no faces of degree zero two or four. <clears throat> let me let me let me uh, you know nothing in the theorem here uses that. The, the only reason you need that algorithm is to actually draw a picture. Right. To draw a picture of the web, but if you don't draw, even if you don't want to draw a picture, you can still compute the probability that the spine of your web is one of the one of the given types. So this is if you go through the uh, from uh, colored triple dimers to non-colored to webs, and then uniformly sample a reduced web. Yes, and this is the chance of that reduced web being shown. Exactly. Or the, the, even though the that that bijection is not canonical, the the number of webs of a particular type is a, is well defined. I mean, the isotope, right? The webs up to isotopy. I mean, even though the individual path may depend on the order, the, the topological type will not depend on the order. Okay, so here's a couple applications. So, so you know, if I if, if I got lots of boundary points. Those formulas from here can be quite complicated, right? There's a sort of an exponential number of terms in this sum, which is, you know, something you can't really uh, avoid. But in some cases, the that there's this compact formula, and for example, if if I'm interested in this sort of the parallel web, where there's just n components which all sort of pair up. This is also a, a graph in a disk, although now I'm drawing the disk as a rectangle. I've got some vertices on the left, some vertices on the right. And let's suppose that the vertices are, have opposite colors and I'm look, interested in this particular web, which is just sort of the parallel. That's a, certainly a reduced web. And the probability that I get that reduced web, the unnormalized probability, is this just a product of two determinants of submatrices of the X matrix. Okay, so this is kind of like the, uh, uh, SL3 version of the Lindstrom Gesell theorem, which counts uh, non intersecting lattice paths uh, in, in, a, in a lattice, which also it's a similar kind of configuration. Which in, in their theorem, there's a single determinant here, there's two determinants, but other than that, it's kind of similar statement. And another, uh, another kind of web which has a nice compact formula is this sort of a triangular honeycomb web. This is, you know, you take this, uh, a big triangle and you, big triangle in the honeycomb lattice like this with some boundaries along, boundary vertices along the sides. Then the determinant is a, then the, the probability is probability as a product of three determinants. So that's kind of nice because, uh, uh, you get this. You get this web with lots of internal structure, but with a very simple formula. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, if you want to go to the scaling limit of a graph, so suppose our graph is a square grid, and we look at the sort of a very large square or very large rectangle on, in the upper half plane. And I'm going to let the lattice spacing go to zero, but as the, as the graph also gets large, so it fills out the whole upper half plane. Then you can uh, look at that X matrix. Well, suppose I have some particular boundary vertices which converge to some complex some points on the real axis z1 through z6, and I let the 
in that limit, the, the X matrix converges, uh, well, up to, up to scale. Uh, I forgot the little epsilon. If the lattice spacing is epsilon, there's a little epsilon there, but the, oh no, never mind. There's a, the, it's a ratio, all right. So there's no epsilon. The X, X matrix converges to a very nice simple function, one over pi times, I should have said X of WB is one over pi times B minus W. And therefore the, the probability, which is a polynomial in the X matrix becomes some, well, here's the, this is the actually normalized probability now. So I divided by the appropriate denominator. And you can see that this probability of this particular type of web, for example, has a very nice, simple rational expression as a function of the, of the limiting points, Z1 through Z6. And you can see that this is a, actually a Merbius invariant function. It's a product of cross ratios. And so the, there, there's a certain conformal invariance property that you see for these limiting probabilities uh, on in the scaling limits. So if, if you remember, in the case with, with six boundary vertices, there's six different possible reduced webs. Each of them has their own probability, which has an expression somewhat similar to this one. This one is just the more interesting one. This is the beetle, beetle probability. So you, you can, in principle, uh, do this, yeah, do this calculation for all, all the other web types as well. <clears throat> and I think that's all I had to say. Oh, here, oh yeah, here was a random sample based on that non-canonical uh, algorithm where I took a big square and I took six boundary vertices. And you can see that in this case, there's the, my reduced web does have a, indeed a hexagon with six legs in there. And these, uh, these uh, paths, are also, you know, at least conjecturally, SLE4 paths uh, in the limit, in the scaling limit. Okay, thanks. Any questions? Yes, Ron. Is there a notion of uh, four dimer covers? So oh, yeah, yes. Uh, you can do the same thing for SL4 and four dimer covers or n dimer covers. The, what's missing is this notion of reduced web. Nobody has a good uh, idea about how to find a natural basis for SL4 or SLN for any n bigger than four, unlike the SL3 case. So the SL3 case is kind of nice because there is this notion of reduced basis. But there is a vector space, it's just, you know. Is there a nice canonical basis for it? I don't know. And how to fit that into a uh, conformal uh, field theory? So this, uh, sometimes we, we have, you know, in loop n, when n goes beyond two, then it's not conformal or not conformally invariant in the limit, but this seems to be still conformally invariant. So it should be, con should give some conformally invariant object, no matter how many dimer covers you super. That's correct. And, and somehow you'd expect SLEs or fours to always be there in that object somewhere. That's correct. So, so I mean, is there a continuum object that- uh, Yeah, I think that the I mean, standard sort of Virasoro algebra conformal field theory is really an SL2 theory. And there's, there's some, I'm certainly not an expert on this, but other people have said that uh, for SLM, there's a variant of that, uh, which is also conform that people who do CFT they know, know about. And I suspect that what we're getting is some objects in that theory. Okay, yes. There's some higher dimensional notion of web where instead of a graph, you have like a two complex now. Every edge has three faces incident to it. Does this have any relation to, I don't know, representation theory? Yeah, I don't know. Not that I've heard of. You can be the first one <laughs> to make the definition work. So when you write down these probabilities, I mean, you have this product of determinants and I mean, is there some, I mean, it looks a lot like book of coordinates and I mean, is, is there some cluster structure related? One. Uh, Yes, I mean, depending on who you talk to, yes, uh, I think there is. 
I mean, Pac Contra coordinates still play a role in the SLN, uh, as you know. Uh, yeah, but, but, yeah. And there's some cluster structure there. But do you see it here somewhere? Uh, you know, this is just, it's, all, it's kind of new for us, so we haven't really explored the cluster structure yet. Let me just say it that way. So I'm, I'm sure it's there. What the ramifications are are not clear yet. Any other questions? Okay, if there's no questions, I said very good.